working on some new techniques in the realm of moving beyond nonlinearity. In my last lecture, I covered uh, natural splines and, and basic splines, steps, polynomials, and we discussed the great things about it. Now we have another tool in our hand that we can use for nonlinear functions. And this is one of the best things that is out there. Has been shown that most of the times is as good as is at least as good as natural splines, and and it's it, it can be shown that if you if you just play with 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 some of the parameters here, it becomes like exa exactly identical. And this new technique is called smoothing splines. The math behind it is a slightly above the level of this course, but I'm going to uh, shallowly shallowly uh, cover that. So, the idea behind a smoothing spline is that you want to use a functional form like gxi and you want to minimize, um, you want to use a gxi in the whole spectrum of the models you can use, smoothing models you can use, that minimizes the error uh, the error is simply the difference of what you predict and what you observe and at the same time you put a penalty on the flexibility of the function. The way you can find the flexibility of the function is, is focusing on the second order derivative of it but square. Remember integral of just second order derivative would be just um, G, uh, first order derivative but here is the integral over second order derivative order derivative squared and this lambda is a penalty you put there smoothing penalty that you put on the on that model in some sense we have bias here and variance here and we want to have the bias variance um, interaction here so we don't want to let this model become as small as possible versus this we use a very flexible function so in in other, in in some sense Lambda is, uh, choosing lambda is very, very much the same as la lasso ridge regression models that we chose when we were considering um, flexibility versus bias. So here lambda is called, uh, a tune is a tuning parameter that's a number more than zero. If lambda is very small, let's say it's zero. If that zero and this term which put penalty on flexibility of function was not here, what would happen was that you would choose a smoothing parameter that would pass every single point. So we would, in our training set, we would pass over all possible points, so that would become zero. But as we saw in earlier chapters, that's not the best strategy you can take because it would do a terrible thing on test data. So that's why we put lambda. So if lambda is very small, let's say zero, you will use a very flexible function. At the same time, if lambda is very large, let's say it's infinity, you put a very large penalty on using more flexible functions, and that's why you just end up with using a linear function. So just tuning this lambda function is extremely important. So, so this lambda is called the roughness penalty. It's a tuning parameter. And as we will see later, depending on this lambda, we get effective degrees of freedom in the smoothing spline. So, so choosing the correct lambda is one of the problems we have to deal with. If lambda is very small, then you use a very weakly or flexible function. If lambda is very large, you just get a linear function for g. So the question is what g is the best? This is the, I think that was the proof that shows that the optimal level of g based on this lambda um, is a very peculiar function. It was a genius proof. It's not too hard to go over it, but 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 I I would never think about that myself. I could never ever come come up with such a proof. But mathematician did a great job and proved that the 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 optimal solution for this function is for this function is uh, simply a natural cubic spline where it had knots at every single xi. So, so that the, the, the optimal solution for the function we had before is a natural spline with a knot at every single value of xi which is unique. So every 
let's say age level in the wage age example for for different roughness penalties so so this roughness penalty is something that um, that controls the flexibility of our function so we do not have a, one of the problems that we had earlier that's that's using knots as we saw in both uh, normal splines and natural splines, we would use the, the selection of knots was very important, but this selection is already done. You have a knot in every single observation. So the only thing that is left is choosing the correct amount of lambda, and as you may probably have guessed, we have to use cross validation to choose the optimal level of lambda. And as we it will turn out later, um, Right, uh, running leave one out cross validation is not too hard on this function. So the algorithm is very complex, but fortunately we have R and R can deal with it and a function period and function couple smooth the spline. And one of the things I want to discuss here is the effective degrees of freedom. It, it can be shown that for, di for different values of lambda, we have the corresponding degrees of freedom. And the way you find it is, um, in the algorithm that solved this smoothing spline, you have some matrix n by n matrices from your um, from your independent variables. These are an n by n matrix. The trace of this matrix, which is just the summation of the um, diameter of this of this matrix, the summation of elements of this diameter is the effective degrees of freedom. So basically the, 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 the thing I want to convey is that this degrees of freedom can be a non-integer number. So you can get 13.5 degrees of freedom 13.238. They're all possible because everything depends on this, um, this matrix and this matrix have a trace, and trace is just a summation of these um, values on the diameter of this matrix. And, and that can be any, any number, any, any positive number. So another thing I want you to notice is that for every degrees of freedom, there is a lambda and vice versa. So choosing lambda is equivalent to choosing a, a correct degrees of freedom in smoothing splines. And the way you do it is by running leave one out cross validation. So, so again, like anything we had before, if you want to tune the parameter, you have to use cross validation. It turns out using leave one out cross validation is extremely easy here. And the, the, the functional forms you get is very close to the leave one out cross validation you had in linear regression. Here, if you can recall, we had a, a, a function called h which were the influence of that point in the regression line. Here you have S lambda ii, that's the uh, ith value on the diameter of this matrix, S lambda matrix. So I don't want you to remember this, but what I want you to remember is that this cross validation for every single value of lambda has a very easy computable function. And that is why what you can do is that for different values of lambda, You can get the RSS or error you get on, on your cross validation error, and you just choose the, the one that minimizes it. So, for example, here it is just this lambda. And for every value of lambda, there is a degrees of freedom. So, so tuning this smoothing splines is easy. And I, as far as I can recall, R would do that automatically for you. So, if you do not um, meddle with degrees of freedom on choosing lambda, you basically um, have the optimal level of cross-validated that are based on leave one out for lambda. So here, what we have is on the wage age error, we saw that the smoothing splines with 16 degrees of freedom does a good job. This is the uh, red curve. Based on this smoothing splines, we can use leave one out cross-validation to choose the optimal level, I'm sorry, I think I made a mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this 16 degrees of freedom is, is a smoothing spline with 16 degrees of freedom. This blue one is the optimal level. That's 6.8 degrees of freedom came from our leave one cross validation. As you can see, it did a pretty good job um, in capturing it. And usually the and the errors you get on on the bonds are not that bad. 
So you get a narrow error at the tails of uh, this data. So to wrap up, smoothing splines are very powerful. Usually the results they get are very, very close to natural splines. Uh, you can use any one of them. And, and, and the great thing with smooth, smoothing splines is that you do not need to worry about nuts. How many nuts you use? Because it will have a nut at every single value of x. But it uses the effective degrees of freedom and you can do it by leave one out cross validation. So you basically can do, um, can have a solution for that. There is nothing arbitrary here. And that's a great thing about it. So that's why I, I myself uh, really like a smoothing spline. The next techniques we are going to discuss is called local regression models. Local regression models are again very great techniques. Um, what they do is simple. Um, in local regression models you first need to tune one parameter and that is called span. That's a number between 0 and 1. Zero means no span, it will be just looking at one value. One means you, whenever you run your regression model, you just need to consider everything. Usually span is chosen uh, a number very, something like 0.3 or 0.5 is chosen. So what you do is that for a given value of span, let's say it's 0.3. At every single point like this, for example, this x is 0.05. So at this value of x, you just look at the span of 0.3, that means 30% of the data that is closest to it. Or 30%, or depends how you consider it, but you can also look at 30% of the range of your variable. So you look at 30% of the model, so this is, these are these orange observations then you put the weight on each observation. The closer those observations are to the point you chose, uh, the more their weights, the further away they are, like this one or this one, the smaller the weight. Then you run a weighted least square model, like this, this, this line, on these observations, only these observations, and then you make a prediction for that very point. So that will be this point on this model. Then you go slightly to the right. So you do this regression line for every single observation that you can find. For example, here, um, we, we repeated this local regression at value right 0.45. Again, we looked at 30% of the observations around us. Then we just ran a uh, simple um, weighted least square. Weighted least square means you put more weights on the values that are closer to this very observation and less weight on the ones that are further away. And then you just run another regression line and just make the prediction of this point. So if you do it over and over again and make the prediction for every single point here and just connect them, you get this orange curve. This orange curve is the local regression model. One of the great things it has is that since you, you always have linear models, uh, the confidence intervals you build will not be terribly bad. This blue curve comes from, um, there's a local uh, regression model with span, let's say 50%. This red one, this orange one is local regression with, let's say 0.3%. So depending on how you change the span, uh, that will be changed. So if your span is zero, the extreme case. If I set span to zero, what it means is that at every point, we ju I just look at um, the observations that are at that point. For example, if I wanted to predict anything on this point, my prediction would be only this point. And if there are two points, I just take the average of the two. So this way, you just get a very flexible function that goes uh, from all the observations, which is not terribly good. If you set span to one, that means you, you're just looking at everything in your neighborhood when you run a regression line, you pretty much get a linear shape. So smaller, so when a span goes down, flexibility goes up. So how do we choose the best level of a span? You guessed it right, cross-validation or just validation. 
remember in validation you set aside some tester data you never touch it in cross validation you you set aside some test data you you use training to to predict it and then change your training data over and over again by the time you, use, you cover all your data points so in cross validation you're not wasting any data in validation you usually do so that is called the local regression model. So based on the cross-validation model, which I, based on cross-validation, you choose the optimal level of span, you tune it, and the, the function you use in R is low S. That stands for local regression models. The next technique, my favorite one, is called the generalized additive models, in short, GAMS. By the way, GAMS is also the name of an optimization function in uh, an optimization software. Um, there, there, there are different things here. It's a GAMS here it has nothing to do with that GAMS. Do not mix the two. In generalized additive models, what you do is that you mix number of models simultaneously. For instance, Let's say you want to predict wage based on three variables, age, year you are in, and education. So education is a factor variable, and the best model we can use to estimate factor variables, if you can just remember, was using dummy variables, and I showed that to you in the beginning of my previous lecture, that. The best models that can deal with these factor variables are just steps. So step functions. So for education, let's say you want to use the step functions and in indicator variables for wage. Let's say in age we saw that smoothing splines or natural splines does a good job, so we just use that. And for a year we also use, let's say, smoothing spline. So let's say for a year we just use smoothing splines. Uh, we use smoothing splines, for age we use natural splines, and for year we just use step functions. So as you see, we want to predict wage based on three different variables, and each time for each of these variables, I want to use a specific model, specific nonlinear model based on what I want. So F1, X1, I it was just smoothing spline or natural spline. F2, X2 was also natural spline. And F3 here was a step. You could add any number of models you want. You can use, let's say, um, another thing you think will affect your wage, let's say, is number of experience, number of years of experience. And let's say you decided that leave one out, um, sorry, uh, local regression models are the best. You can just put that here as well. So when you run your models based on generalized additive models where you can consider all of these models simultaneously, the outcomes you get are somehow interesting. So the outcome, the, you can get such outputs and each output shows the marginal effect of that variable with that model on your outcome. But that is the relative marginal effect. So that means, um, or maybe I didn't use the correct word. So that's the relative effect above that variable to, to your outcome. So for example, so here on wage, F1 here means um, wage. We saw that as years progressed, uh, the effect of year on wage has some nonlinearity here. Why? Because we saw there was some, um, we had, a very great recession recently and, and that's why in some years not only our wage didn't increase but also it decreased but before that the economy was booming so it was it was increasing and after um, we dealt with uh, recession it started increasing as well and this is the effect of age on wage relative effect of age on wage and as we can see this effect increased by age and later on uh, when you get into 40 years, up to 60 years, it starts smoothing, and then after 60 years, it goes down. So that's the relative effect of wage. And education, as what you what, what you can see here, is that as your education increased, 
the degree you get, for example, high school, bachelor's, master's, PhD, and maybe more than that. Oh, less than high school, high school, less than college degree, college degree, more than college degree. This is um, graduate degree, your, your, your wage increase. So, so as you saw, in, when you use generalized additive models, you can combine many different methods simultaneously, but the problem is you cannot see the absolute effect of that variable on the outcome. You can just see the relative effect of each variable. It's pretty simple to use GAM models in R. If you just want to use natural splines, you just use NS. So here I want to, uh, we want to have a linear model of wage. Our first component is natural spline of that variable uh, variable year. The second one is natural spline of age. And lastly, since we had just factor variables, we put it as as just factor variables education, and we took care of it as step functions. And and we can get very nice plots out of it. And it, it, the way you use it is plot gam. And if you have many different models, and each model has one variable more than before and has a more fancy variable, you can use a function called ANOVA and compare all of these models and choose the best one. And that, that is actually very cool about R. You can just put different models inside ANOVA and give you the best model. That's so cool. And I'm going to explain it in our R session. If you want to use um, smoothing splines or local regression models, then you have to use function GAM or GAM, stands for generalized additive models. Remember before I used LM, now I use GAM, GAM. And then you, S stands for smoothing splines and LO stands for local regressions. We can also add uh, interaction effects in these models. And if you can remember, um, if you want to have an interaction effect of two variables, you just put column here. You can also use generalized additive models for classification models. Everything is almost the same. You just use GAM. And uh, you have the variable you want to predict as your outcome. So here, I wage more than 250 is a factor variable that gets value 1 when wage is more than 250k and it's 0 when it's not. So we can we just run it on here. We, we consider it as a simple model here, just a linear model on here. Smoothing spline of age with degrees of freedom 5. Education. But one thing you have to set is family. Family should be set to binomial to, to let R knows that you're using this model. So to wrap up, in today's lecture, we learned so many things. So I'm, I'm, I'm citing the thing we covered in our first video as well. The first thing we covered was polynomial. We discussed why polynomials are, are not too good. Specifically, when you, you want to use or you're tempted to use polynomials degree 5 and above, you see the tails do not have that much um, good confidence interval. Then we discussed alternative ways and started with simple steps. We showed the benefits and the problems of it. And then we moved ahead and we talked about splines. In the spline, we considered three classes of splines, normal splines, natural splines, and smoothing splines. Then we discussed local regression models. And lastly, we ended up this chapter with GAMS, generalized additive models, when you could um, you could mix different models in just one model. And the great thing about it is R can take care of them very effectively. So thank you so much. I see you in my next lecture.